Hey guys, we're in the shop today cutting belt blanks to get our belt material packs restocked on the website. And when I was cutting that, it reminded me I've had a few emails come in with some questions about building belts. Now, if you buy our belt material pack, it's for a lined belt. So it will come with your strip and a liner. Both of those will be Herman Oak so that you can build a lined custom belt. Um, this is not a one strip belt blank at like 10 ounce or something like that. This is a nine, nine 10 ounce body and then a three, four ounce liner. Um, in that pack, there is also a worksheet. And in that worksheet, I kind of show you how I take uh, somebody's measurement, one, how to measure the, the belt that they're wearing now so that you can get a good measurement, and then how to take that measurement and turn it into your cut length on your belt so that you can begin tooling it. I'm going to show you that, but I've had a couple questions on um, how you take the floral tooling pattern belt packs that we sell or any belt tooling pattern. Most of the time when you buy a belt tooling pattern from anybody, it's only going to be you know, yay long. It's going to be somewhere around there. It's not going to be the complete belt because the person that designed the pattern doesn't know how long your belt that you're building is going to be. And so I'm going to show you how you actually link those together. And so how you fit them in and fill in any transition there where the two ends meet. But there is a couple tips on using our belt blanks that I want to show you or just some things that I do when I'm making belts. As we're cutting these belt blanks, leather's leather. So it's going to have um, imperfections and some wrinkles and some different things that happen to it before it gets to you. And so um, I'm going through and culling out uh, some of the belts that have more more distinguished kind of blemishes on there and stuff like that. Depending on the size, I'll use those um, at some point. And a lot of times I can just cover those up with a tooling. So as I'm tooling, I can actually, you know, background those areas down or something like that. We've mentioned that before. But there are some times on some of these belt blanks where there's some things that I do, even if the belt is pretty good or if it's got a few imperfections. And I'm gonna show you those right now and we'll go ahead and cut one to a specific size and I'm gonna make a stock belt for the floor. So that was a good opportunity just to kind of do this real quick little tip video and kind of show you what I do as far as getting one size and then getting that pattern transferred. That's the main part of this video. So let me show you something. Okay, so here I've got a couple belt blanks that I cut. Both of these blanks are really, really nice. This particular side, if you watch my Instagram stories from Saturday, um, I talked about this side. This side was beautiful. I, I really didn't want to cut it into belt strips, but um, they're gonna make beautiful belts. Um, and every side's different. Every side you get is different. And some of them I don't even cut into belt blanks because they've got too many imperfections. So we'll cut other projects out of them. But these two belt blanks are fine. One of the things that you might see in some of the belts, if you can see there, in the, there's a dent right there. That is probably during transit or during uh, packaging or when they're moved around inside the tannery. It's just a dent is all that is. It's not a break in the finish. It's not a cut. It's just a dent. And um, I personally don't worry about that. But this belt, I didn't want to send out to a customer. I'm not going to say that if you order belt blanks for me or the belt material packs, that you might occasionally get something like that in one. We try to pull them out if we can, but if we're running low, I'd rather send you something you can use than just tell you I'm out. So I don't really worry about those myself when I build a belt because by the time you tool this and case it and stitch it and edge it and slick it and do all your stuff, you won't even notice that. So those are fine. There are some other things that will come up in a belt blank, and I don't have one here, but you might see... Um, more stuff like a grainy um, imperfections and stuff like that. You can work around a lot of that. But the one thing I wanted to show you on these two belt blanks in particular is I'm cutting all I'm cutting all the belt blanks with a draw gauge. And this is an old CS Osborne solid steel draw gauge. And that's what I use to cut all my belt blanks out. Um, I'm not using a stripping machine that, that, that'll cut a whole side at one time or anything. Um, maybe someday we'll do that. But right now, it's just quicker. I just cut them with this. And so it's fine. But what happens is sometimes is with me doing it by hand, I might get a little off. And if you can look at this belt blank, it's got a little bit of a sway right there towards the end. Now, this is not a very bad spot to be for that because this is the next side. One of the things that you always want to remember when you get a belt blank or when you cut one is you would prefer to have the butt side or the butt end of the blank where it came out of the butt of the side, you'd want that as your billet in or your end with all your holes for adjustment in there where you would put the person's brand or initials or anything like that. That's gonna be the densest fiber of that strip is gonna be from the butt area. 
And so that's what you're going to want your billet in because it's going to take the most wear. That's where the most uh, wear and tear is going to be is in those holes. So we always want that as our tip. This end is the neck or from towards the neck. We cut the neck off, but it's towards the, the middle of the back towards the shoulder. That fiber is going to be a lot more loose. It's not going to be quite as tight. The easy way to see is to usually take that belt strip and kind of bend it. And you'll notice a little bit more wrinkling in the grain. If you see a little bit more wrinkling, than you do on, on the butt side. The butt side will usually stay pretty smooth. You don't want to squash it and make wrinkles in it, but you just want to kind of give it a little test and just see how many wrinkles. You'll notice you usually can feel, and you can kind of feel this end just feels lighter weight, not necessarily thickness. This should be the same thickness because they're leveled, but you'll feel the weight of it seems not as dense as the other side. And a lot of times too, you can look at the back of the leather and you'll notice this looks a little bit furrier and this looks a little smoother. That's kind of a good indicator. But we always want the belt, but the butt of the belt to be the end. But on this one, since it's got that little divot, that's on the shoulder side or the neck side of the strip. I'm not gonna worry about it. I'm not gonna send it out because it's obvious. You can really see that. And with me not knowing how long that particular customer might need this strip to be um, for to fit the customer he's building it for or for himself, he may need this area and I don't want that dip, dip in there like that. So we're gonna go ahead and use it here. But for us, the length of the belt that we're gonna cut this out of, we'll end up cutting that off. So this belt blank, there's nothing wrong with it. Absolutely nothing wrong with it because I won't need this anyway. We'll cut it off, say yay, about right there. And that'll go in the scrap bin and we'll use it somewhere else. Now on this other one, you can see this is the butt end here on this one. Another indicator on the neck, a lot of times you can see a few more wrinkles. You can see that there's some wrinkles in there and that's because it's getting up towards the shoulder which is naturally going to have more wrinkles so that's the neck over there this is the butt end but if we look at this particular one this was the first strip off of another hide that i had cut and the backbone of that hide was really soft it, the, the leather feels amazing but that one buck corner right there where that was was just super soft and it kind of got squashed in transit you know ups truck whatever it just kind of kind of got squashed up a little bit and so it's got a few more wrinkles it's uh it was cut straight and it looks good but it's just a little spongy and just doesn't feel right what i almost always do on a belt blank before i cut to size is i'll take that butt end and i'll burn some okay and so basically I will take the butt end, you know, even on this one, like we got that little scar right there, there's a little scar there. I'll just go ahead and cut that off because the tip of my belt, I might have a brand or initial and that scar would show up under there because I'm not gonna floral around that. So I go ahead and just cut it off. You're only losing about that much. These strips are 60 inches long. That's how I cut, how long I cut all my belt blanks uh, before sizing. So I've got plenty to work with generally. And so like on this one, I'm gonna cut off more. I'm gonna cut off this entire section right here that's just not any good. It's just kind of wrinkled up and it's not gonna be very sightly when I'm done with that belt. So I'm gonna come past that and just lob that off. And that may, may seem wasteful, but it's better to go ahead and do that. And if you wanna save it and use it somewhere else, that's fine. But as you're talking an inch and a half strip by yay long, we'll just cut it off. It will go in the box. We will find, it'll, it'll come up at some point in the future and we'll probably end up putting it somewhere. But I go ahead and cut it off so I've got clean ends. You don't have to necessarily worry about making it perfectly straight. You're gonna end punch this anyway here in a minute. So that's not real crucial, but it's just to kind of clean your tips up. So I always burn some off. My father-in-law was watching me build a belt a couple years ago and he watched me burn about, I don't know, I just cut off about two inches and there really honestly wasn't anything wrong with the blank. I just have gotten in the habit of always cutting a, just a tad bit off the tip to just kind of make sure we're clean. And um, he said, why'd you do that? And I said, well, just to make sure I've got, I'm, I'm down to good leather right here on the tip because that's the spot everybody's gonna see. So that's what I do there. Then we're going to size this belt. Now I'm gonna build two stock belts in a 38 inch. I'm just gonna kind of get them started. I'm not gonna build them today, but I'm gonna, I wanna show you that technique on the pattern. So we're gonna do two stock belts. I'm gonna go ahead and make two of them 38 inches long. Um, that's the size that I want these belts. So if you, that, that would basically be the, the number somebody gave you off of their existing belt, the way they measured it. So if they gave you 37 and a half, then that's the number you use. I'm gonna use 38, so these are an even uh, size number 38. And I add 10 and a half inches. And the reason we do that is because what we're gonna do, and we'll show you on this on this belt blank here exactly how that works out. I've done a, I've done a video on this before, but I do a seven inch tip on our belts. And so that leaves enough 
hanging out past the buckle when the person's wearing it to where if they have initials or anything out here on the tip that they'll show past the buckle. So I'm gonna come in here seven inches, that's our center hole. From center hole, we wanna measure the 38. So what we'll do is we'll put our tape measure on our seven inch mark on this end and we'll come down to 38 because that's what size I want this belt. So we're gonna put a mark at 38. That is our bend. That's where we're gonna fold over and put our snaps. My bends, you set them up however you want, but I found that three and a half inches works perfect on a belt. And so I do a three and a half inch bend. So from our 38 inch mark, then we go to, to three and a half, that's where we'll cut it. So we'll just take that and cut that off. And you can see the way I block out my hides by cutting the butt and the neck off that not counting the little bit that I cut off the tip, but basically we're putting that in the scrap pile on a 38 inch belt versus if you cut that whole side in an inch and a half, you're gonna throw away a piece that's more like that long and there's not a whole lot you can do with it. Um, it's probably gonna be longer than that. So it's just kind of wasteful. I'd rather have the butt and the neck to do other things with than to have a bunch of strips, you know, 24 inches long that um, inch and a half wide I can't do anything with. So that's gonna be that. And so what that ends up with is our measurement of 38 plus three and a half plus seven, that's where the 10 and a half inches comes from. So if they gave you a measurement of 38, you'd add 10 and a half inches to that, and that'll tell you how long to cut the entire strip for a person's belt. So 38 would be 48 and a half. So if we measure this now the way we did it, it's 48 and a half inches long. And so that's how, that's where that math comes from. So now this belt is ready to go and we'll do this one the exact same way. Now I'm not gonna mark the three and a half and the seven, you certainly can just to check your math to make sure everything's correct. But I've gotten to where when I cut belts for the shop is I just do the math real quickly in my head and I know that 38 inch belt needs to be 48 and a half inches long. I'm just adding the 10 and a half. Now obviously if you wanna do a three inch bend versus a three and a half, you would take and drop that half off of there. I'm not a mathematician but that's the way the math works out in my head. So, but there we go. We got two belt strips, belt blanks that are ready to go for a size 38. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, tip both of these belts and then I'll show you real quick how I transfer a pattern. All right, so now we're here at the chopping block. I've just got a big English endpoint um, cutter here. You can definitely do this by hand when cutting using a round knife or cutting it with a, with a knife or a razor blade. But having an end punch really is nice. Um, it's handy. They're not, they're not the cheapest tool out there, but you only have to buy them once. And I don't think I've ever sharpened these, so they, uh, they tend to work good. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to center the point of this English, and I just eyeball it. You can certainly measure it and lay it out, but I just eyeball it. And um, put that on there. Make sure the space on each side of the leg of this tool is the same on each side of the belt strip. This one's wider. It's like an inch and three quarter maybe, inch and seven eighths, but it works great on belts. And then, and we just chop that off and that points the end. And then I'll do the same on this end. And you can certainly, some guys have a custom um, bend area die that they use that cuts that out or they cut it out by hand and kind of a real nice scallop look. I just do this, um, but I am I am going to try to spice it up a little bit and do something a little bit different on my bins um, going forward. But then that's that, and that's our that's our blank there. Now, one thing that I like to do on belts is to remember what side was the neck. Okay, after you size it and kind of remember. And usually, what I will do is I'll write the person's name in pencil on the bend end here near the point. Um, I'll use it just write their last name or something like that. So I know whose belt it is. I don't have to check the size every time. I know that I've already done that work and that is that person's blank. And since this is stock, I'll just write stock on here. And I just write it lightly in pencil so I can see it just enough to see. You're gonna put a rivet or a snap and stuff in there. You won't see it when you're done. So that belt's ready to go. Okay, so I'm, I will prep this belt when I, whenever I go to tool it, but I wanna show you real quick just how to use these patterns. Now this is a belt pattern that I'm not sure it might be on the website or something. I'm not really sure. I, I draw a lot of new patterns all the time. Um, and so this is just one that was on the bench that I'm gonna show you real quick. But I do them all fairly the same as far as they're roughly the same length and they all kind of go together similarly, depending on the pattern. But it's just on a piece of cheap tracing paper. If you've got mylar or tra transfer film, that's even better. Um, I just burned through most of it 
so much that I just got to where I just used regular tracing paper. My belt is completely dry. And what I'm going to do is first thing is this is the bend end. Always set your belts down left to right on the bend. Real quick on prepping. I haven't prepped this belt. You will prep yours before you do your pattern and carve in and all that. Um, and I do have a video on how I prep my belts. You can go back and check that out. But always get in the habit of setting your belts down left to right, bend on your left, tip on the right. That's just, that's the, the right way the belt should go. Just get into that habit. Um, and then I'm gonna come here and I'm gonna put a mark at seven inches. That's double the three and a half, which is my bend. So this will fold over and this tip will meet right underneath that. That's where I start my tooling. Now when I start my tooling, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna transfer this pattern onto here. Now, if you've got a piece of tracing paper and you have drawn a pattern on there, you need to, you can flip it over and then draw on the other side in pencil. That'll put lead on both sides of the transfer paper, basically. And then, so then when you come into the next way, if you need to spin it, you can, and you'll still be able to transfer lead. And I'll show you what I'm talking about here. I'm gonna line up, I've got a line on the pattern that is the actual outside line of the blank. So I'm lining that up along the edge to center my floral pattern on the leather. So as you can see there, those outer lines of the pattern are actually on the outside line of the belt. And your belt may curve a little bit, so you just as you go, you walk it around and kind of move it from side to side and make sure it's centered. And you can definitely uh, take calipers and make your border line first if you wanna do that, that's absolutely fine. But then what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna trace this pattern with a pencil onto the leather. Now you want to kind of pick up, make sure you got all your lines. You may miss some before you pick it up. Hold a finger down on your pattern so that you can come back and catch any lines you might have missed. It's hard to get them all and you kind of miss some occasionally. And so once you know you've gotten all the lines, then you can remove your pattern. Now as you can see here, tracing it, there was pencil on both sides of this, so it actually transferred the lead straight to the leather. This leather's bone dry, it's not wet. And so it transferred that lead, and we can still erase it if we need to. If we, wanted, if we didn't like something, we could just come in here and erase it and then change it, okay? Now what I will usually do is for me, because I can see it better, is I'll go back through now after I just kind of double work, but I'll go back through and I'll get my 8B pencil. This is just a number two. Um, and I'll get my 8B and I'll redraw all this just so that it's nice and crisp. I can clean up anything that I might have wiggled weird when I was tracing or something like that, but I can make it just perfect. Um, you don't have to do that. If you want to freehand, kind of freestyle carve this and you got enough there to see, then roll on. A lot of times I do that as well, but you're going to want to, you know, just be sure you got enough there that you can see the pattern. But I am going to darken up this petal or this fly, uh, leaf right here because I want you to be able to see this really well in the video. So I'm just gonna read, just draw right over it and just darken it up with his 8B pencil. The 8B drops a lot lot more lead than a, than a number two does because it's softer. So that's what I use to draw on leather with um, as far as veg tan for my floral patterns. So now you can see that leaf stopped the pattern. So our pattern runs full, starts here, where we'll put our maker stamp right here and that'll be kind of the beginning. And then it runs this way and then it stops at that leaf. Now what we can do is we can come in here and add the pattern again. Now this pattern, this one in particular is designed, we put it on like that with the leaf pointing up to the top of the belt. And so now if we slide this down to where the leaf stopped, it, this pattern is drawn to where it actually ends and stops, or starts and stops, correct, you know, the, the easier way, here. Now if you wanted to shorten it up, say we were at the tip, and you didn't need this whole section, but you wanted, you know, say from, from here to there, because you don't need this piece, because you're a little too, the belt's a little too short, you can flip this over, and then bring it over to where it's overlapping the leaf. 
So if we put a mark, we'll say we need to stop around there because we've got our brand on this end. You can overlap this leaf up to that mark. And now all your vines coming out of the leaf in the same direction. Main thing is to remember those S's, okay? Just like we've talked about in other videos, it's making an S and then the cur it's curving from one direction to the other, one direction to the other. And so you just wanna kind of flip your pattern to where it's going the right direction. We wouldn't wanna go this way because now it's coming out from under the leaf in this direction and that's gonna look funny because we're coming here this way. And so then you're making kind of a weird shape. We want it now that we've come here, now we wanna go this way. So we've gotta find a spot in the pattern, whether we have to flip it or move down to another section, because you could also come down all the way to here and overlap to at this point where the flower comes out. Now the reason I wouldn't on this particular pattern says put that flower way too close to the leaf. There's not enough distance in there, but that's just personal preference. But when you're joining these patterns, it's a lot of it's a lot of kind of give and take and, and just artist discretion on that on what you want to do. But we're going to go ahead and pretend that we want it a little bit shorter, and so I'm going to overlap and I'm going to put that pattern down, just like we were talking about. And now I'm going to trace this again. We'll kind of pick it up make sure we got all of our lines so now we'll darken up what we did here so that you can kind of see how these connected so now if you look at the way this pattern ended now on this end the leaf is down it's pointing downward because we flipped that pattern over and went in opposite direction so now this leaf it's the same leaf as here but now it's pointing down. And our, our overall pattern, you know, our flowers right here, our overall pattern is a lot shorter because we overlapped. So you have the ability to change the length of the, of the pattern and kind of the placement of the flowers. And you can do that all the way down the belt and change the length, change the pattern to where the flowers aren't just set on a certain distance. And you can kind of customize it a little bit. But as you see here, this transition just runs very smoothly from this leaf into this vine work naturally as if you drew it by hand that way. Every pattern is going to be different. Some of the patterns that you use, you'll run them this way and trace those off. And then when you get down to the other end, you'll have to flip them um, unless you overlap them. They might find another spot in there. You could do what we did here, but you're in control of kind of the flow. So the bulk of the pattern has been drawn for you, no matter whose pattern you're using, they've drawn the, the bulk of the pattern. But as far as the transitions and the connections of connecting end to end these patterns to get an entire belt pattern, that's up to you. And so be creative and kind of look at look at the pattern, look at the vine work, remember the fundamental stuff like we've talked about um, in our articles and in other videos as far as that flow, that flow and direction and kind of think about how the pattern ended and then how you need to transition going forward into the next section. And um, if you do that, you can, any pattern, you can make it work, you can customize it, you can even change direction sometimes and, uh, and make something really neat, go around brands or crosses or anything else you might want to on the belt. So um, that's kind of how you connect, you connect these patterns. But remember, they're all, they're all meant to be put end to end. And so that, that way you can do a belt any length you want to. You can do it 150 inches long if you want to. You're just going to have a bunch of these going end to end in sections. All right, guys, so that's how you do the pattern. I've had that question a lot where people have asked, I'm not really sure how to connect these. Like, I don't know how they connect. It's not that it's not difficult. It's just one of them deals you just got to kind of pay attention, but it's a good learning experience. If you're not yet drawing your own floral patterns, tracing them, these off for one, like just tracing them off, is teaching your hand kind of how those lines are run, how things are structured, how vine work is, is working in the pattern. And so anybody's pattern that they draw, you're getting a, a, a touch of their style and kind of how they structure their framework. Um, but doing the transitions to where these, the way these will flow from end to end to each other, 
that's where you're gonna gain a little bit extra technique and skill that you might not have had if, if, if I was to say draw you an entire piece of transfer paper or mylar with the belt specifically for your size. Um, so that's the way belt, belt patterns have been done for years and years, the craft aids, everything else. That junction point where they meet doesn't always fit perfectly. When I design belt patterns, a lot of times I try to do that to where you, it, it's more like this one to where they fit perfectly end to end and it's easy to see but you still have to adjust when you get down to the end because it might not land exactly where you want it. I personally, if I don't have a brand or anything on the tip, so what I'll do is I'll back that pattern down and squinch it up just a little bit to where a flower will land right here on the end of the belt or where a leaf will. Um, something to just kind of signify the end of the pattern. But like I said, that's it. That's just a quick tip. I just wanted to kind of go over that real quick because we have had, have had a few questions to it. But main thing is have fun. Remember your, your framework, your structure, transitions when, uh, from other videos that we've talked about and just try to be creative and keep that flow going. It should go in an S shape. It should not just go, you know, come out this direction and then have something come out funky coming out of the other way. Just try to think about it. It's all going to look good. Your tool in a belt is fully flower carved. Everybody's going to love it. It's just one of the things where if you're trying to refine and trying to get to the point where you can draw your own patterns, that is a good learning opportunity there, working on those transitions. And it, real quick, if you really want to challenge yourself, when you lay the belt out, try to lay out with maybe a gap of about two inches between the end of the pattern and where the next one starts. And then see if you can connect the two with your own version of vine work in between. It's a little trickier, you gotta have a little bit of flow. Your drawing's obviously gonna be different than mine because we're two different artists. But if you can if you can accomplish that, that that's kind of challenging because you've got a break in the in the flow and you're gonna try to mend that break with your own version of vine work. So challenge you to try that on some scrap, see how that works. It'll just start getting your mind thinking and getting you used to drawing your own stuff. So thank you all very much. Have a great weekend. We'll see you in the next video.